Chapter 12. What after salvation? Pat Jones had spent the night in the caravan parked at the side of Ken Knight's home, together with Paddy, who had nowhere else to live. We spent the next day together, and I told them both of my experience. I assumed and expected them to fully understand and see what had happened to me. Instinctively, things were different to me. An internal change had come about, and by it, I had new desires. I no longer wished to live as I'd lived in the past. I wished to be rid of my bad ways. No one told me I'd give up any particular way of life. I found within me an internal desire to choose the good and refuse the evil. Upon reflection, I say this was the evidence of the new birth. And I later found this experience spoken of by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in John's Gospel, chapter 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, and except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul writes also the same in Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I knew also there was a part of me which was just the same. When I would do good, evil was present with me. The Apostle Paul in Romans also expressed this, Romans 7 verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Whilst this was my experience, I found it impossible to convey this to my friends, even though I tried ever so hard. I had in my possession much stolen property. In fact, hundreds of pounds worth of stolen goods. I was no longer prepared to live off the benefits of stolen goods. What should I do? I had involved others in my crime of stealing, and these could not help me now. In fact, Mick West came to see me the next day, and when he heard me explaining Jesus had spoken to me, he began to fear I might go to the police and confess my crimes. I did not actually say to him I wanted him to return the colour TV set, which I had stolen and swapped for his Citroen car, but he was concerned, as he did not know what to think. Poor Mick. He must have panicked, thinking I was about to go to the police. As he was concerned, some of the stolen goods that I had left in his garage were stolen, including the mini-engine, the mini-sub chassis. I don't remember what happened to these parts, but I asked Mick to dispose of them. I was later informed that they'd been dumped in the reservoir. That Saturday evening, both Pat Jones and I decided to go to the social club at Park Street. This was a usual thing for us to do on a Saturday night. I had determined to go and see my mates and explain what had happened to me. We walked down there, but did not go in. After seeing one or two people, I broke my news to them. I can't remember what I said. I had no desire to stay there and went back to the night's home. My inclination to live it up as normal was no longer with me. I now seemed at a loose end, not knowing what to do next. From that time forward, Pat Jones began to realise things had really changed for me. The next day being Sunday, Mrs Knight took both Pat Jones and I to the local Baptist church at Southcourt in the evening. I distinctly remember the passage of scripture the preacher was speaking from. It was in Exodus, where the whole nation of Israel was about to enter the promised land. However, they listened to the evil reports of the ten spies and did not take heed to the voice of the two good spies who had given encouragements to go in and possess the land. I remember also I saw, whether he preached this or not, that this was a picture of the body of Christ, the church of today. After that meeting... Mrs. Knight introduced me to Martin White, who gave me a copy of the New Testament called The Good News for Modern Man. I began to read this straight away. This I received gratefully and began to read it every day as it was in simple English. The following day, the following days were spent in the afterglow and certainty of this new life that had opened up to me. I thirsted for knowledge the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. I told the folk at work about my experience and could not remain silent about the things I was learning. My evenings were spent from then on at Mrs. Knight's home discussing the scripture with some of her Christian friends. 
Both Pat Jones and Paddy all seemed interested to hear. I now amazed at my own ignorance then, for until then I had never read the Bible for myself, I could hardly read. I did not know what the Acts of the Apostles meant. Within two weeks I had read the New Testament in this small Bible, the good news for modern man, and thought I understood it. I soon learned from the scripture that in the economy of salvation, it was the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross at Calvary that was the means of me obtaining a free pardon from all my sins, but also that I was given freely a righteousness to justify me before God. In this respect, the Lord Jesus was a true substitute and he died for me without cost at all to me. These were the things which I learned, as it were, and drank like water from the well of salvation. I learned them by reading the scripture. I didn't know them from the night Jesus spoke to me. I attended college that week, but there was a difference. I had decided I would not dress as usual in my clothes to show off, which would have been Levi jeans, white boots with red toe caps or whatever colour I chose to spray my car that week, a Ben Sherman shirt, a loose leather jerkin. I felt I must not only be more sober, but dress more soberly too, i.e. not show off as I used to do. So I dressed my best trousers, which were from my Prince of Wales check suit. Shirt, normal pullover and normal shoes. Of course, I had to tell all my friends about my experience. I protested to them, look, I even dress differently. They couldn't believe me. I told one of my lecturers, Mr. Jones, in front of them all, but I was just given a smile of wonder. The same week, I felt constrained to go and tell my friend Rupert, a West Indian from Jamaica. He lived in the room at 14 Bister Road, Aylesbury, so Pat Jones and I went down to see him. As soon as I met him and told him what had happened in front of his new girlfriend, Rupert said, his reply was, I told you, Dave, not to take that LSD. Again, they were numplus. They couldn't believe it, even though I tried my best to convince them. Being in the world, but not of it, I did not wish to continue the way of life that I had lived in the past. My back was now turned from the world I built for myself. I was self-seeking one's own glory, asserting self without considering others, stealing, thoughts of adultery, fornication, drug-taking, boasting, drunkenness, violence, worldly ambition. I say worldly ambition because I believe we all have worldly ambitions, but when we are converted and come to Christ, we are called to forsake it. This is forsake the world and its ambitions. We all have our own worlds to forsake when we become a Christian. Some have a religious world to turn from as a person may have been born in a religious family or have a circle of religious friends, but in their world they have their own natural fallen nature to contend with. Fallen humanity, fallen human nature seeks to gratify its desires and as such sin the whole day long. A religious person still has all the workings of the natural man, as those have that have no religion. Any thought or act which is born out of selfishness, greed, pride, avarice, evil thinking of others, backbiting, slander and prejudice may all be practiced by those in a religious or non-religious world. So to forsake the world means to forsake all those things and actions which are natural to us and are contrary to the way of Christ. The religious and non-religious persons need to turn from their world. Some persons have no religion or religious friends, yet they too have natural desires, a fallen human nature which they seek to please, ambitions of fame, for its own sake, the love of money, selfishness, the practice of gossip, evil speaking of others, are all to be turned from. It doesn't matter whether you be religious or non-religious, we are to forsake the world from which we've come. When we seek to follow Christ, we are called to be in the world, but not of it. This is really what John Bunyan sought to express when he told his story of the man who turned his back on the city of destruction. One of the problems, however, was then that his story only describes the picture of those who were non-religious and the pattern of their lifestyle. In reality, a religious person, one who is not born again, has a pattern and lifestyle which is equally wrong and such need to turn from. It's easy for such a person to think because they don't do certain things that they see in non-religious world do to look down and judge them, thinking they're better than them. Not so. We all have a world to turn from. 
When a person is born again, they have an ordinary life natural to them and are part of the natural world, but we all must turn from our world in order to follow Christ. I now had an inward and real desire not to continue in those ways, which I just mentioned, for they just perpetuate my former sinful self, of which I had had enough. A change of heart had taken place. This was a fight. That is not to say I couldn't be tempted to find pleasure in sins. There was a part of me that was still the same, but I had a desire to put to death sinful thoughts, actions. Should I allow wrong affections to move me, I was self-condemned, with an accompanying self-abhorrence, and I knew what was pleasing to God. By the grace of God, I was able to resist and fight against sins. I was now moved by a new set of principles, but here lay the problem. I had erected a 48-foot by 24-foot wooden builder's shed on the waterboard ground next to Ken Knight's garage at 24 Mount Street. This became my garage and workshop. I had stolen the builder's shed from a building site in Berkhampstead. I had persuaded Mr Knight to drive his lorry with me, with Pat Jones and Paddy, and we stole the shed panels from the building site late one night by putting the panels on the back of the lorry. In this shed was my newly acquired Citroen DS car, which had formerly belonged to Mick West of Wendover. I'd swapped it for a colour TV set that uh, we had stolen from an old people's home in Winslow. I had some lovely garage equipment, which included a trailer, arc welder, trolley jack, air compressor, spray gun, tools, speedboat engines, even a stolen car and various other items, all of which, by one means or other, I had stolen or burgled. What could or should I do now? I was responsible for this stuff. Conscience would not permit me to continue to make use of all this stolen gear. What should I do? Should I just dispose of them and brush off the past behind me? How should I dispose of it? Or, or decide what to do? I couldn't sell the goods, for what would I do with the money? Conscience would not allow me to use it. I had, in fact, so much stolen property go through my hands, which had been disposed of by one means or another, none of it could be recovered anyway. I'd only just stolen a brand new mini car, which was about to be used to make up my lovely new car. The body had been cut up and disposed of. It was a 1968 mini. It was in my parents' garage at Fimir Crescent Aylesbury. Whilst cutting up the body with the art welder, the hydroelastic suspension caught light and nearly burnt the car and the house to pieces. My parents were away on holiday at the time. But also another stolen Morris Mini Traveller, which was swapped, which swapped the number plates and disposed of the old body. This was a use as a hire car. I think on reflection, with hindsight and faith, I now, having God, I would have been able to act differently as I did then. I was able during that time to return one or two stolen items. Late one night, one wet night, in February 1972, Pat Jones and I loaded the trolley jack on my firm's van, and I'm not quite sure what Pat Jones thought about this, but I drove up to the garage from where I'd originally stolen the trolley jack and parked it back on the garage forecourt. The garage had been closed for the night. It was next to the Broadleys pub in Wendover Road, Aylesbury. And whilst no one was there, I opened the van door and swiftly and quickly lifted the jack and placed it on the forecourt. We then drove off as fast as I could. I often wondered, what did the owner think when it was returned several months later? I had no real advisers or anyone who could tell me what to do or knew the depth of my crimes and the amount of stolen goods that I had. I was faced with a problem. Whatever happened to me was no real concern, but I did not feel I could involve others and get them into trouble. Mick West was very fearful in case I confessed to the police, and he was puzzled, had been puzzled by what was going on. He had offered me the colour TV set that I'd given him for his Citroen, but he wished to keep it. So I gave him the Citroen anyway, as I felt I couldn't use it. I didn't need anyone to tell me what was right or wrong. I knew the difference, and in particular, the sin of fornication, which was sexual activity outside of marriage. Sexual temptation was really fierce and strong in me, but by the grace of the Lord Jesus, I fought the fight against it. So much so, I had to avoid meeting girls because of a natural inclination, which had I given in to, would not have been good for me or them. The words of Jesus were clear. 
that the very thoughts of sex with another man's wife was to commit the sin of adultery. And I agreed. This area of my life was really difficult for me, as it would be to any believer. It was common amongst Christians in those days to say that, smile, God loves you. And enthusiastic Christians would wear badges saying, smile, God loves you, as though they felt this was the way to get people interested in the gospel and to follow Christ. It was the time when hippies were interested in love and not war. And if you went to San Francisco, you needed to wear flowers in your hair. I, however, had read the scriptures and knew it was written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And in another place, Pharaoh had been raised up as an object of God's hatred, and he was destroyed. It was evident to me that there was a lot of ignorance among professing Christians But I didn't know how to convey the whole truth of God to people But at that time. It would have been more accurate to wear a sticker saying God is angry with the wicked every day and more effectual to make people think. The truth is, God loves the elect, those whom he had chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I could not reconcile how those who would be damned for their sins were ever loved by God. Pat Jones began to acquire new friends and some of them were what you call hippies. They smoked pot, took drugs, and generally did nothing but think about life and everything every day, and generally didn't work. We invited them down to Mount Street, as I felt it would be right to speak to them about Jesus Christ. About five or six came, and they ended up sleeping in the shed. Whilst trying to share the gospel with them, I saw no real effect and was very disappointed. Perhaps one day I will see some fruit, I felt it okay to use a shed to house these hippies. About six lived in the shed for a number of weeks until they moved on. I thought I was put in the shed to good use. My problems were solved by an intervention of God, and his hand was clearly seen by all one year later. The situation came by a knock on the door. It was a CID who had come to arrest me for stealing the colour TV set that Mick West had and I had stolen from the Redfields Old People's Home in Winslow. This is where I started my story in the first chapter of this book. 